In this video, I want to share with you the 14 mixing tips that have had the biggest positive impact on my music career over the past 25 years. Now, this was a really hard list to compile because I wanted to make sure that each of these tips are one of the ones that actually changed the game for me and took my music to the next level. And I can almost map what happened after I learned each of these individual skills because they were that much of a aha moment and a kind of plateau smasher. Some of them are a bit more of a framework or philosophical. Some of them are practical, but either way, if you apply them in your music today, I guarantee it's going to sound better. And before we jump into the door, I recommend downloading my free mixing guide below this video. It's my 30 most powerful mixing tips that you can just keep on your desktop, apply each of them to your music, and you'll instantly hear the improvements. So without further ado, let's hop into the door and get it done. Okay, so the first of these mixing tips is simply to invest in a half decent pair of headphones or good quality studio monitors. Now the difference this made to my mixing was just night and day. In fact, it directly led to me winning my first remix competition way back when and getting my first agent and then my career took off after that and it was all because I spent £120 on a pair of Sennheiser HD 25 twos. Now these are DJing headphones, they're not even studio headphones because the most important thing when it comes to getting a pair of headphones is that you learn how they sound and you do that by listening to lots of your favourite music and the genre you're producing on those headphones until you get used to them. Now these are HD 650s again by Sennheiser but nowadays there are lots of great headphone models available that are pretty cheap so I've put some links to them below this video. Okay, mixing tip number two ties in to the first one. So when I got the good headphones, I also started referencing music a lot more because it was like the lights were suddenly switched on and I could actually hear details that I couldn't hear before. So using reference tracks is great for every stage of the production process, but in particular for mixing. So what you need to do is bring in a reference track into your door project that is in a similar vibe as the music that you want to produce. So similar frequency spread, similar instruments, and then compare your mix to that as you go. Now, I'm not gonna go super in detail on this because I've created another video on using reference tracks, but basically you drag it into your door, you take the volume down by about minus 12 dB and this counteracts the mastering that's been done in terms of the increase of loudness because if you were to compare your track to this track, this track's going to sound a lot louder because it's been mastered and that's why we take it down by 12 decibels. Now as a general rule of thumb, if you leave your master channel at zero and aim for your mix to be peaking at about minus 6 dB, that's the perfect level to move into the mastering stage. And let me know in the comments if you want to see a video on that. Now the second tool I use with regards to this is putting a Voxengo span which is just a free spectrum analyzer so you can actually see what frequencies your reference track is hitting and then you know what to look for because you can put another one of these spans on the master channel so you can compare your frequency spread to that of your reference track. Now this next tip is one that I think I devised, I'm not sure, maybe I stumbled across it or perhaps I learned it from somewhere else, but either way, it is one of the things that has made the biggest difference to my mixing workflow. And I can directly attribute the increase in the quality of my mixes to this one trick. So this really is an absolute game changer. And that is to have a mono switch on your master channel. Now, if you've got a proper studio set up and you've got an audio interface or a mixer whereby there's a mono button that you can simply switch it on and off, that's fantastic. But for simplicity, I like to do it within the DAW itself. So on the master channel, in Ableton at least, I just get a utility plugin, I create a keyboard shortcut that's very easy to access, and all I do is assign it to this mono switch. And that's gonna switch my mix from stereo to mono. And the reason why that's useful is if you balance the levels in mono, there are a few things that happen. One, it takes the stereo feel out from the equations, so it makes it easier for your ears to focus on the relative levels. So we can keep the stereo image out of the way, because quite often a very wide stereo mix with lots going on can just make it harder to focus in on the actual levels of the elements being mixed. I find this is also useful for EQing as well for exactly the same reason. You can hear which frequencies are clashing much more easily if everything's in mono, because it's kind of like a logo. If you think of a, a logo for a company, a really good one is gonna work in color and black and white. So mono is kind of like the black and white version of a logo. If you can get your mix sounding really good and powerful and clean in mono, when you do switch it back to stereo, it's just gonna sound incredible. So let's have a listen to how that works. So this is my mix in stereo at the moment and I'm just going to switch it to mono like that. And now I can hear how loud the different elements should be a bit more easily, especially when 
there's all this bloopy bloopy stuff going on in the stereo field. So if there's one tip that you take away from today, let it be this one. Okay, my next game-changing mixing tip is using what I call the top-down mixing approach. Now, this is something that I've developed. I teach my accelerator students this, and it's the fastest way to get your mixes finished without becoming overwhelmed. So we've got quite a simple track here, and that's just for example, but a finished track will usually have 50, 60, maybe even 70 separate tracks going on. Some more complex productions, even more. And that can be very overwhelming for people. It's like, what do I mix first? First, how do I know what to balance against what? So the top-down mixing approach is very simple and all it's stating is that you mix from the most important element down in the hierarchy of importance. And in dance and pop music, that's pretty simple. It's the kick, the bass, the main clap or snare, and then the lead vocal or the lead synth, depending on what genre you're producing. So you get the kick sounding good on its own, then you bring the bass up to sound good with that kick, so they both sound good together, then you bring your main clap or snare up to sound good with those other two elements, and then your main lead sound as well to sound good with those other three elements. So at that point, all you've done is you've mixed four things together that sound really good, and then everything else just has to be brought up and work around those core elements in order of importance to the mix. Now this ties into my next tip which is anchoring the kick so I'm just going to do that and then I'll show you the top-down mixing approach. Anchoring the kick basically means that you set it to a particular level and then you don't touch it for the rest of the mix so everything just has to work around the kick. Now I found the ideal level to anchor it to is so that it peaks at about minus 12 dBFS. Now this isn't an exact science so please don't obsess over it. Somewhere around there is going to be a good starting point for the rest of your mix though. So we can see here I've just got my kick and it's peaking at minus 12. I've left the master channel set to zero because if you remember, ultimately we're looking to have everything peak at about minus six when we go into the mastering stage. Again, not an exact science. So now we've got the kick anchored. Let's use my top-down mixing approach to bring in every element in order of importance. Now I'm gonna use my mono switch and switch it to mono because again, it's gonna make balancing those levels easier. So we'll switch it to mono and bring up the bass. And we can use our reference track to see if we're roughly in the right area. Okay, so what we need to do is copy a part of the reference track that has just got the bass and the kick and as few other elements as possible just because it's going to be easier for our ears to compare. So we'll switch from the reference back to ours. Okay, sounding pretty good in terms of the bass. So now we need to bring up the next most important element which is the main clap or snare. Okay, so now let's bring up the next main element, which is gonna be the main synth riff. So you can see I've really simplified the mixing process. Now everything else just has to work with those four elements and it makes it way easier, way faster. One of the most powerful mixing tips that I have to offer you. Now my next mixing tip is gonna make your mixes way cleaner and reduce some of that mud and clutter and build up that you probably hear in your mixes. It's simply to roll off the low frequencies of almost every element in your track, apart from the kick and the bass, of course. So if we have, as an example, an open hat, let's just load an EQ onto here and see what's happening on the spectrum analyzer. So you can see all of this information down here under 100 Hertz is completely useless. It's sub information, it's sub bass, and that's gonna be fighting with our bass. Now, even if it's a quiet element in the mix, cumulatively over the whole track, if you've got 50, 60 tracks, all of which have got this sub frequency information that's not needed, your low end is gonna sound horrible. So it's really important to remember, roll off the low end that's not needed. So if we have a look at this, we can take off all the way up here, up to 199 hertz, and it's made no difference to how it sounds. Now, you could probably take it even higher than that depending on the instrument that you're using, but it's always important to listen out for whether you've taken off too much, because sometimes you can end up with a bit of a tinny mix if you roll everything off too high. But anything under 120 hertz, as long as it's not the kick or the bass, and maybe the lead vocal, you're probably gonna be golden. Okay, next mixing tip can be applied in the production stage or in the mixing stage, and I know this is powerful because I've helped producers use this 
who now have tens of millions of streams on Spotify. It's simply treating the main bass and the sub bass as separate instruments. And the reason this is so powerful is because if you find that your mix isn't quite working in the low end, perhaps you don't have enough sub frequencies, you can just bring up the sub bass channel, which makes mixing way faster and way easier. Now there are a couple of ways you can do this. Now the first and the way I usually do it is to simply duplicate my bass channel and then have one as my normal bass or my mid bass and then one of my sub bass and then EQ them accordingly. So for this one we've got bass and then I'm just going to put an EQ on it and take out all the sub frequencies under 120 hertz. So now it sounds like this. And then for the sub bass simply get another EQ and then roll off the top end at about the same place. So we'll turn that one off, turn this one on, about 120 hertz. So our sub bass line sounds like this. But I'm gonna make sure that I take off the delay effect I have as well, because you would usually want the sub bass to be pretty narrow in terms of the stereo field to avoid running into phase cancellation issues, but that's something for another video. Just trust me on this. Having your sub bass predominantly in mono is a good way to avoid potential problems. So now we've got these two basses. We can adjust the sub bass independently of the main bass, and it's as simple as that. Now in some situations, it might not be practical to have two separate bass instruments. For instance, if you've got some really cool modulating dubstep bass that you can't just duplicate. Now the other way that you can do it is in one channel or the channel itself, and the difference is you're just creating two chains in this audio effect rack, one EQ'd as we showed before at about 120, the other one the opposite like that, and then you can just mix them here. But personally, I prefer to have it on the mixer channel rather than the audio effect rack because it just makes it quicker and easier and I'm all about that. Okay, next game-changing mixing tip that really took my music to the next level was learning about buses or in Ableton it's called grouping, but it's basically where you send two or more instruments into one audio channel so they can be processed together. Now the most powerful of these for me is the kick and the bass. So if you select the kick and the bass and group them together, and let's just call this K and B bus. The quality in your low end can just increase dramatically by getting these two things together. The reason being, you can gel them together with a little bit of compression. You can even add some more harmonics with saturation, which we're gonna to touch upon in a few minutes anyway. But let's just have a listen to what happens when you group these together. So normally, that's how it sounds. The grouping isn't doing anything because we haven't applied any effects. But now let's add a little bit of saturation and compression using the drum bus from Ableton. And this is just several effects rolled into one. So what we've done is added a little bit of saturation and a little bit of low end harmonics here with the boom function. Then I'm gonna put on a glue compressor and we are gonna take this down to about two and a half dBs of gain reduction, which we can then boost back up again. And to make it a fair test, we are going to take down the volume so it's peaking at the same level it was before. So if we group them all together and turn it off, we are peaking at about minus nine and a half. So let's make sure we're peaking at about minus and a nine and a half. And now listen to the difference that makes when we turn it on and off. Now with the rest of the mix, let's try it. So this is off. Just a bit weak and a bit empty. Now with it on. Yep, kick and bass bussing together, fantastic tool. I recommend you use it. But you can also use it for other elements. So if you've got some keyboard stabs with several instruments layered up, just group them together and then you can process them as one. It's gonna make it sound way glossier, give you loads more control and ultimately make it sound more professional.
Of course, another example of where this works perfectly is if you've got vocals in your track and you've got backing vocals and lead vocals, you can process them all together and treat them as one. All right, for my next tip, it is using auxiliary channels specifically for spatial effects like reverb and delay. Now, there are a few reasons for that, but the main one is simply a matter of control. So if we have a vocal track like this, Don't know what you do. there's a little bit of reverb baked into the sample, but that's fine. But if we put our main reverb on the track itself Don't know what you do. Don't understand how. any processing that we do on the reverb is obviously going to be on the dry vocal as well so what I like to do and what I recommend you do again this is an absolute game-changing tip is use auxiliary channels for reverb and delay so if I put this reverb on an auxiliary channel turn it to 100% wet so our dry signal isn't being doubled up and then feed some of this vocal in you've just got so much more control over it now an amateur producer would just put on a reverb and forget about it but to get a really clear and non-muddy mix what you want to do is then EQ that reverb separately from the dry vocal so we can take out just the low frequencies of only the reverb and not our main vocals Perhaps we want to take out some of the frequencies where the main vocals are singing. Take out some of the highs. So now our auxiliary channel reverb is treated like a completely separate instrument under its own. And that leads me on to my next most powerful mixing tip. And when I learned this, this is when I actually started getting commissioned to work on pop music and stuff that was really going to be heard by a lot of people in which the lead vocal and the lead instruments are super important. Because before I did this, sometimes my vocals would get lost a little bit in the mix. And if it's an underground dance music track, that doesn't matter so much some of the time. But if the vocal is the main idea of the track, this is essential. So we've already got our auxiliary channel reverb here. What I'm going to do is put a compressor onto that and I'm going to use it as a sidechain compressor. Now you probably already know to use sidechain compression to make elements of your mix duck in time with the kick to allow more space for the kick to breathe through and that's a really good tip as well. Perhaps I should have added that to this list anyway. But assuming you know that, what we're going to do is press the sidechain button and take the input from the dry vocal or whichever lead element it is you're working with. Now what can happen if you've got a lot of reverb is that the dry vocal can sometimes get a little bit lost in the reverb. So let's have a listen to that. Don't know what you do. Don't understand how. And we really want that lead vocal to pop through. So what we're going to do is compress the reverb from the dry do. signal just a little bit. Don't understand how. No, I'm so into you. And this is a subtle effect. But now listen to it. Compared to this. So you can hear what's happening. The dry vocal is ducking that reverb. And then when the vocal stops, it allows that reverb to come back up to full volume and then die out. And this one tip really did help my career take off when it came to working with higher profile artists. Okay, my next game changing mixing tip is to use a room reverb on one of the auxiliary channels. I always use it on the first one. And this is where you can feed in little bits of pretty much every element in the mix. And it just makes it sound like it's all coming from the same space. Now, if you ever run into to the problem where your mixes do sound a bit weak and tinny and just they don't glue together that well this is probably going to solve that problem so i'm just going to do um, an example of what happens when we play the kick and the drums together without the room reverb so it sounds good right and i've fed in a little bit of the kick and a little bit of all the drums to the room reverb and if we look on my channel you can see here it's just a short reverb with a short decay time a little boost of volume and rolling off the low end and let's turn it on and see the difference or hear the difference so that's with the room reverb on and this is off listen how much kind of emptier and tinny it sounds when it's off and soloed this is what it sounds like so you can hear some vocals are going to it, some of the synth, and with everything on, it's like this. And off. 
Not a huge difference. But it just gels everything together. And again, that was one of the things that just elevated my tracks to the next level. For number 12, it is bus processing. Now, we already touched upon that with the kick and the bass, but it works for other buses as well. For example, with these drums, we've got all these drums going into one audio bus. So all the drums are going through here. And you can see here, I've got this group processing. And the biggest win here was learning about saturation, specifically at the group level. So I'm just going to get rid of all these effects. Sounds pretty good, OK? Nice. And let's listen to it in the mix. We'll turn the vocals off because they're a bit distracting. Now, what I'm going to do is add some saturation to the group level of these drums. I'm going to use the saturator that comes with Ableton, but usually I would use something like the Oxford inflator. And all I'm going to do here is just saturate this signal very slightly and listen to how it can make our drums pop and shine in the mix. So this is where we were. And this is where we are now. And saturation works fantastically on pretty much every element in the mix. You have to be careful that you don't overdo it, but we already looked at it being used on the kick and bass bus as well. And it's a great way to increase the perceived loudness of your sound without just jumping up the volume. My next mixing tip is to check your mix on multiple systems. If you're anything like me, sometimes you'll export your track, you'll go and listen to it in your car or on your headphones or on your smartphone or wherever, and it just doesn't sound anywhere near as good as it does in a pair of studio headphones or on your monitors. Well, that's to be expected. But if you listen to some of your reference tracks on the these other systems, they do still sound really good. And this is why checking your mix on multiple systems is really important. And the way that you do that, much like when you get a pair of headphones, as we touched upon earlier, is to listen to a lot of music in the style that you're creating on these various systems. And then when you compare yours to theirs, you can hear where yours is falling short. Now, it can be a bit of a pain to have to export your track and then take it to these different places and listen to them. Again, if you're in a good studio, you might be able to switch between a few sets of monitors, really quickly, but you can also get plugins nowadays to help with that. So I've got Mix Checker Pro here, and there's a link to this below this video, but this basically emulates listening to it on different systems. So you just put it on your master channel, and then you can choose these different systems. Again, obviously compare your reference track as well. So I'm gonna to have to put my reference track to the master channel. I can hear now that the reference track, I can hear the bass, but on mine, it's quite hard to hear the bass, so I know there's work to be done. So what I can do is make tweaks whilst listening to it through this Mix Checker Pro. But again, this is one of those game-changing tips that just changed my life, changed my career, because then I could start making music that didn't get rejected because it sounded bad on the system of whomever was listening to it, but actually translated well across pretty much all systems. So if you're not doing this at the moment, it's definitely something to start doing. And the last mixing tip that made a huge difference to me and really allowed me to build a career in music production is to work on other people's music. It's a great way to use your skills to make yourself some money, but it's also a great way to understand how music works on a deeper level and improve your own mixing skills whilst getting paid for it. With websites like Fiverr and Soundbetter, it's never been easier to market your skills to an audience who really don't care if you've mixed Kanye West's latest album or not. They just want to hear a few examples of your music that you've mixed so they can hear that you know what you're doing and then pay you to do it for their music. There are lots of producers out there in the world who enjoy the production process but don't really enjoy the mixing process and they're not that good at it and they're happy to pay you to do it for them. So it's even worth underselling yourself first to get a few clients in the door even if they're free just so you've got a few tracks in your portfolio of work and then you can start charging more for your services. And if 
feel not that confident with the quality of your productions before the mixing stage, you can actually just do a Google search nowadays for free audio stems so you can practice your mixing skills even if your production isn't that great yet. So there's no excuse not to use these tips that I've given you today and practice your mixing. Now I've made so many mistakes with my mixes over the years that even the tips I've shared with you today couldn't fix. So to stop you falling into those same traps that I fell into, I've compiled all of those mistakes into one easy to digest video right here. So if you want to avoid the most common mistakes I see producers making that ruins their mixes, I recommend checking that video out. But before you do, if you enjoyed this video, please like it and consider subscribing to my channel if you want tips like this each and every week. Thank you so much and I'll catch you over at that next video.